um, just to keep a nice quiet line. So welcome everybody. I'm so excited to have Adam Quiney with us today. Um, this is the first of four sessions Adam's going to facilitate for. So he is going to dive us right in to the coaching conversation or the conversation that we have with clients before they become our clients as they're becoming. And I think that's the most um, kind of high stakes part of our coaching relationship right there. And so we're very, very excited. We're going to step through the whole thing for you. This is our first call and our next three calls are all going to be in November. So we're going to have our first call. You're going to have sort of a month to think and digest and then, and then just dive in and make sure that you're signed up for all of the calls in November. But what we are going to do today is we're going to get to know Adam and we're going to get to know a little bit about his journey into coaching and some of the shifts that he's gone through as he's had his own coaching journey that I'm sure many of you can relate to. And then we'll, we'll touch a little bit on um, what he's going to be covering in all of our four sessions. And he'll give you kind of an overview of that. And then in the middle, in the midst of all that though, we are going to be taking questions. So what I would like to have all of you do is I'm going to start asking Adam some questions and we'll kind of get into it a little bit, but I would like you to all think about what, where your curiosity is leading you. What gets you really curious? What do you want to know about Adam? What do you know, want to know about his journey? What do you want to know about the topic? And about, you know, 10, 15 minutes in, we're going to start taking your questions and we're going to make this a really nice dialogue amongst our community. So I'm so happy that you're here and that you're willing to play. And, um, let me start by giving you Adam's sort of official bio, all right? So Adam Quiney is an executive leadership coach specializing in working with the smartest people in the room. A former software developer and attorney, Adam's learned the hard way about the costs that come from keeping your heart safe and chasing after external rewards to feel whole and complete. From love, Adam is connection, passion, presence, wit, and brilliance. From fear, he is awkward, robotic, apathetic, irrelevant, and arrogant. He's learned to embrace all these parts of himself and works with others to do the same in their own lives. Living with his beautiful wife and their two dogs, one of which is a cat, in Victoria, British Columbia, he is a man on a mission to bring the world to a more inspired and fully expressed place. So Adam, um, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so, so happy to have you. Uh, I, I think one of, one of the things I'd love to start with is what got you into coaching? So I'm, you know, you're a software engineer, attorney, um, great professions, not a lot like coaching. So I'm really curious kind of how that journey maybe started for you and maybe some shifts that led you into it. Yeah. Well, first I'll just say I'm, I'm excited to be here and um, thanks everyone for taking the time to show up today. It's an honor to get to spend this time with you all. So um, I'll do my best to like summarize and just highlight some salient points, but I think actually what drew me to software and also probably law a little bit was that innate part in most of us drawn to this profession, which is like, I loved helping people. And so on some level, my heart was really in the right place. As a project manager, I got to do more than just write code. I got to make sure that my team was um, recognized and that they were getting their needs met and stuff like that. And um even though in practice, it doesn't always go this way as a lawyer, you're spending a lot of time, like in a lot of ways, you're almost kind of like the counselor of last resort for your clients. They're so angry and they're frustrated and they feel wronged and powerless. And you're kind of the only person that's listening to them. Um, so I think there was a element of just this pull towards this profession. That was a bit of a byline all the way through. Um, Having said that, what really initially drew me to the profession, I think was um, 
I'm just trying to get the right way to describe this. You know, you and I were talking about this a little bit before, Nahid, like I was immediately drawn to the idea of like, wow, you get to say the thing to the person that's going to change their life and make a difference. Who wouldn't want to do that? And the way I was relating to life was that I'd figured it out. And yeah, there was like this thing over here that um, needed some fixing. Like I just needed to tighten the bolts on this part of my life, this horrible mess that I wouldn't call a horrible mess. But aside from that, I had it all figured out and life was pretty well organized and put together. And so the reason I think I got into coaching was really initially a combination of like from my truest self, a desire to help people to make a difference, to have a positive impact. And then from the part of me that I, you heard described in that kind of response to fear, there's another part of me that was like, these dummies need help with their lives. And I'm the one to help them figure it out because I figured out my life. And so I'm going to help them be more like me. And so I think it was a combination of both of those, which is kind of a beautiful thing, you know, like our love and our fear together bring us towards the path that's there for us to walk. It's not the end of walking that path, but it does present the beginning of the path. Yeah, I, I, I so love that. And I'm sure many of us in this Zoom room here can relate to it. You know, just we want to help. And maybe when we originally got the idea of coaching, it just seemed like the coolest profession because we could, you know, save everybody, right? Save everybody, <laughs> um, be kind of the hero, fix everyone's problems. And a lot of us, you know, we can't help it. We still kind of have that part of us that's sort of driving us. And then we come into coaching and we learn that it's a little bit different than that. And um, how did that happen for you? I took time. So feel free to interrupt me at any point if you want me to slow down or stop or ask questions. But um, the way I found myself into coaching was I was practicing law. I was doing um, income tax law, which turns out to be fascinating because you're dealing with people that are brilliant, mad geniuses and have figured out how to defeat the tax code. And you're like, how do I legally attack this puzzle they've created? Or you're dealing with people that are untethered from reality and believe if they sign their name with an infinity symbol and refuse to let the judge address them by their first name, then they can get away without paying taxes. And you're like, how do I even argue with this? So fascinating area of law. And um, yet there was a part of me that was really clear. This is not the path. There's something about this viscerally that I can tell maybe intuitively. This is not where I should be making my mark in the world. There's something off. And so I met a former attorney who is now a coach purely by happenstance. And we went for lunch and he told me what he did. And I was like, this is amazing. I can't believe, do I have to keep this secret from everyone? Will the whole world try to take on this career? And, um, and he told me, if you want to be a coach, hire a coach today. Like you got to love being coached. That's more of the work than anything else. You got to do all your work and get good training. You know, you can call yourself a coach without being trained. And frankly, most of the professions doing that just because that's true doesn't mean you should separate yourself, be distinguish yourself from the, the, that diluted majority and stand out and hold the profession with reverence. So I hired him as my coach and I took the training he'd taken and um, it was all pretty fine and good. And I was asking, you know, those questions like, what do you want to do in your life? What's in the way? What do we need to move out of the way? And he was asking me those questions and I was getting trained to do all of that. And so that's what was happening on the surface. But the bigger picture was that I was simply showing up to my coach and to the training I'd taken the exact same way I'd shown up everywhere else in my life up to this point. So there's no shift underneath the contraption I'd built on the surface. I was working hard at coaching. I was being smarter than everyone else at coaching. I was um, letting people think that they were getting in with me while actually secretly keeping them at arm's length. I was doing all of the things that I'd done to get by as a project manager and a software developer and as an attorney. It was just now that the context in which I was doing it was called coaching, but who I was being was very much the exact same person. And so, um, where that led me was feeling kind of uh, disillusioned and frustrated and bored and um, self sabotage Like I noticed that I was, at the time I was smoking a lot of pot and I was smoking a lot of pot and I was forgetting about the pro bono client calls 
that I had showing up for me. And that was a real like warning flag for a number of obvious reasons, but it was like, oh, I thought this was going to be the career that magically solved all of that. And yet here I am having the same experience I was having practicing law, practicing software. So um, that led me into a program called Accomplishment Coaching, which at least some of the people on this call are familiar with. And that's where things really started to shift. So I can talk about that sort of initial shift, but I want to give you an opportunity to ask anything or point to anything before I do. You know, I just love that you're so candid about <laughs> that little piece of it, because as you say it, I can tell you with all honesty that I know that I went through that too. Like when you say keeping people at arm's length, you know, pretending to be in relationship, but really keeping them at arm's length. I'm like, you know what? I resonate with that. That's, that's what I did many of my first years. And yeah. it took a while to shift out of that. And I'm just wondering, and maybe just a show of hands, so you don't have to bother taking yourself off mute, but how many of the rest of you kind of resonate with some of the things that Adam said, you know, kind of coming into this, but maybe not doing it, you know, fully in the way you do it now. <laughs> All right, we've got some people willing to put themselves out there. Yes. Yeah. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there because I know that I really resonate and I really appreciate that you said that so authentically because I think a lot of coaches have to go through some significant inner shifts before they can be as powerful as they can be. And, I, and I'm guessing it's a lifelong process for all of us who commit to this profession. But, um, but thank you for sharing. And I'm, I'm curious to move on. Yeah. My, uh, my coach said to me once I was sharing, this is just sort of in, in connection with what you said, I was sharing with her um, something, I'd, a breakdown I'd created. And I had some shame. I had a bunch of shame around it. Um, and, and plenty of altitude, you know, I've been in this for long enough. Now I can see with some altitude, but there's still some shame. And she said, you know, Adam, if you had this all figured out, if you weren't making any messes, you'd be no use to anyone, you know, like it's in the breakdowns, it's in the messes where the opportunity for our humanity arises. And that's where people can see themselves in us. And so much of the coaching profession is trying to put this polished, you know, like a statue, this monument out into the world, but we can't relate to a monument. We can't see ourselves which is perfect because that segues exactly to the kind of initial point where I got jostled out of this pattern that I was talking about. So I signed up for this course called Accomplishment Coaching. Um, I was quite nervous because it was very expensive and long and um, it required a weekend every month. And I live in Victoria. So it was a travel down to Seattle and a hotel room. So very expensive. We were already six figures into debt for my law school and my wife's MBA. And, and yet on some level, viscerally, I felt pulled in this direction. And um, the woman I was talking to about it just really got me. She kept listening to my objections, not trying to fix anything about them and stood for my possibility and asked me if I wanted support and what would support me. And so eventually I got myself to a yes. And I went down to, um, to this training for the first weekend. And my attitude was, uh, well, it was a couple of things. First, it, I noticed everyone was really weird. They were all like smiling and making a lot of eye contact and like very enthusiastic. And I thought, what a bunch of weirdos. I'm going to do what I know to do around weirdos like this, which is defeat them at intimacy and eye contact. So I will make better eye contact than they will. I was basically gaming them with my brain was what I was doing. All right, I'm going to be the more affable person. And I've made two jokes so I can make one and a half more joke. And then that's the appropriate, you know, all of that stuff. And I was also very arrogant in hindsight. My attitude was kind of like, I learn best by teaching. So you train these other dummies. And that really was like on some level who I was being, you know, that language, you train these other dummies, I'll put in what I see to put in, I'll ask the smart questions and, um, and we'll get through this and I'll get what I need to get. And the good news for everyone is that that got knocked out of me pretty darn quick. And so what happened was we started and they told us we we're going to introduce you to the front of the room, bit of a unique way. We're going to point to the person you're on this planet to be your highest and greatest self. And we're going to point to everything you're putting in the way of that. And I said, great to myself. 
And what I thought was like, what's left? You know, I've been reading personal development books since I was a kid. I've got a whole bunch of them on my bookshelf. I know how to win friends and influence people. I told the appropriate two and a half jokes. I'm making eye contact better than the rest of you. And uh, so they asked me, may we work with you? And I said, sure. And so they had me talk for three minutes, you know, tell us about yourself. Who are you? What do you want to do? And then they said, okay, we're going to work with you. And I said, sure. And they said, here's the thing, Adam, the package looks great. You're charming, handsome, witty, well-dressed, well-educated. You're a lot like this device here, a brand new iPhone where we want to play with you and it's entertaining and novel while we do, but then we set you down and we go have a beer with our friends because we can relate with those people. And you, Adam, are very much like, <clears throat> excuse me, and very much like a perfect shiny suit of armor. There's no way in. Currently, you have no access to vulnerability, no access to intimacy, zero access to authenticity. And in that moment, it was like my whole world exploded to dust. Suddenly, I could see the thing that had been almost like the thing I'd been tripping over all my life, but it had been invisible up to this point. And um, you wouldn't know that this was happening because on the surface, what you saw would be sort of like, huh, interesting. Hmm, that's an interesting point because I was working so hard not to let them see the impact what they just reflected to me was having, which is hilarious because that's exactly what they're pointing to. So I'm doing it as they're pointing to it. And so I'll, I'll start to wind down here a little bit, but they told me a couple more things. They said, this is a custom designed set of skills for an attorney. You scan yourself for your flaws so you can address them on your own terms and before anyone else can. You scan other people for their flaws so you can punch them there. They will become scary or intimidating or you need to manipulate them. Use your wit and your intellect to manipulate the conversation and make sure it never goes anywhere that's not safe, never goes anywhere with even the potential for vulnerability. So you could get excited about reading Brene Brown and go out to try to practice it, but the only place you've created that would allow you to practice vulnerability is already safe. So you've kind of headed it off at the pass. And lastly, you let people think they're getting in with you while you're actually keeping them at arm's length. Incredible skills for an attorney. You don't need any support from us to be a magnificent attorney. These are miserable skills for a relationship. And so I thought, well, crap. And I could see in every, you know, I could see sort of the evidence of this in every romantic relationship I've ever been in, where intimacy has always been the breakdown that we've come up against. I could see it in the way I would show up at school. I would show up with friends, the way I would show up with coworkers when we were outside of the context of our work. And the last thing that they told me was, uh, you can leave today. We hope you don't, you're entitled to, you get everything but your deposit back. The good news is, Adam, you'll still be a leader. The set of traits, the sound of your voice even, the way you dress, just the way you show up in a room, it's innate. We look to you for leadership and you look to step into leadership. And you've probably noticed you even tend to be the one that leads group projects probably. Is that accurate? I'm like, yep. Mostly because I'm a control freak and don't want to let these other people mess it up, but never mind that. And uh, they said, yeah, the great news is you'll still be a leader. However, you will forever be a leader of followers because those are the people for which this will be enough. They will be satisfied with this way of you showing up. If you're willing to do the work to unlock this from within and let us make a difference for you, the person you're on this planet to be is a leader of leaders. And so I witnessed, I, can't, I think it was 11 more people go through the same process. And I was seen by 11 people absent my filter and saw 11 people absent their filter. And the Sunday evening after we'd finished, I drove from Seattle up to Vancouver where I was staying with my brother, about a four hour drive. I cried for about four hours and not because I was sad so much as just opened in a way I'd not experienced in 30 odd years of my life at this point. And really for the first time in as long as I could remember, I was, I was devastated by love. And so that, be, that was the beginning, right? It, it'd be nice to be like, and then everything was great, but that's where everything started from. That was the first sort of point where I was like, holy cow, there's a vastly different world available than the path that I've been walking. Wow. I love that story. And I think that's so important. So I know that you all came here to talk about creating coaching prosperity. And I just want to say that one of the things that I strongly believe is that that starts from within us. There's some pretty deep work we have to do within us in order to 
attract the kind of people that we want to track. And I love what Adam just shared. It was a very personal, you know, kind of entree into coaching. I resonated with, you know, a lot. I just really resonated with it. And there were things that you brought up when you, when you shared your story that I completely hadn't thought about, but I'd gone through as well. So I'm wondering if his story is having a similar impact on some of you. And if anybody would like to, before we move on, to kind of gently move into our topic, um, would anybody else like to ask Adam a question or just share um, what they're resonating with or what's coming up for them as they hear his story? You can just, can, you can raise your hand or take yourself off mute and I'll sort of juggle you around. Who would like to share with Adam what's coming up for them? I'll share. Um, Thank you. Yeah, just, just hearing you share that moment, you know, um, in front of your teammates or your classmates and all, it, it took me back, first of all. <laughs> but mo and in addition to that, like, and as you were sharing, I was just getting goosebumps everywhere, which to me is a indication of truth. Um, and, and to your point, like, and to your point, Nahid, like what resonates with me is that, you know, it's me, myself, that is often getting in the way of having the life and or the business or the whatever it is that I really, really want. And what I mean by me, myself, is the, the ego part of me and myself. That's the part that keeps getting in the way with the relationship with my kids, my husband, the, the, the potential clients that um, maybe I will follow up with but not really stand for what's possible. Just like, oh, okay, you're not ready. Sure, no problem. Uh -huh. When, when, uh, two months? Oh, yeah, no problem. Okay. Like, that's what's in the way. And if I can clear that, you know, it's been four or five years and getting there, but not there. So that's what I really resonate with. Thank you for yeah. sharing. And I, I would agree. I would say everything that holds me back when it comes to business building is my ego, the parts that are still there that I haven't worked through. Would anybody else like to share something, either a question for Adam or just something that came up for you as you were listening to his story? All right, we will move can, on. Can I speak to that first, Naid? Yes. There's a, a couple of things. Like the first thing I, I really, um, thank you Nenor for sharing your experience there. And, um, the experience you described, right? Like it's my ego getting in my way is so relatable. You know, I think all of us can really like, of course, of course it's my ego getting my way. It's my ego being afraid, my ego trying to look good, all of that stuff. And, and I'm not putting this on you, Nanor, but I notice a lot of, we relate to our ego as like this bad thing that shouldn't be there. And what happens, what I see happen is then as coaches, we can fall into this a little bit like, oh, I've got to be beyond my ego or, I got to have my hands around my ego instead of simply owning that we have an ego and putting it out into the space feels horrible. You know, describing the, it didn't feel good just in how to describe the arrogance that I was going down to this training with and that it really was relating to people as a bunch of morons. And yet when we are willing to do the courageous work of just owning that there is a part of ourselves that at times can show up like this, that gives people such an opportunity to see themselves because that's what we're all doing. We're all like, ah, these dummies over here, but I shouldn't think of them as dummies. And so, and then this other person, well, Adam never seems to think of people as dummies. So if only I could be like him. And when we put ourselves into the space and allow the, the vulnerability that comes from owning the parts of ourselves that we kind of wish might not be there, it really creates a clearing for other people to start to take some grace and to be able to acknowledge those parts of themselves. And that's where change can really, st that's where transformation can really start to happen. So thanks for owning that. The second thing I want to um, provide is actually a context for the rest of this conversation and really for the next three that we'll be having, which is I really get, um, it's kind of an edgy thing to put your hand up or maybe you don't have a question or maybe it's like, well, I just don't know what is there. 
And that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I notice that often we do that out of fear that we don't have the right thing to say, or we're not sure what to ask, or we're not, uh, I don't have something of value to put into the space or whatever it is. And the context I want to provide is twofold. First, that coaches are leaders and leaders coach. Coaches are leaders because we have to model the work. A coach that coaches well-being and has a complete experience of a lack of well-being, people aren't going to hire that coach. It's just, it just doesn't make sense. And so as coaches, we have to be willing to lead. We have to step forward before we know. We have to model this work. And the, the, I guess the second fold part of this context is that there's an opportunity to practice your leadership here in this conversation. When Naid or myself or Nano or anyone says, do you have a question or something to share? Whatever shows up for you, whether something shows up that might be like, ah, I couldn't do that. Or, uh, no, maybe I'll let someone else go. That's part of what is blocking your leadership. So I just want to make an invitation for everyone to step into your leadership, be in the practice of stepping out into the discomfort of asking the question, of sharing the thing that might be there to share, because you really have no idea what kind of value you might be bringing into the space. Yeah, here, here. I would say we've had some of our richest, richest conversations on these calls as people have started to engage. So I know it can be scary. We're talking about pretty deep stuff here, but I really appreciate that. So Adam, let's begin to bridge to what we're talking about in these four sessions, which is creating coaching prosperity, which means having a relationship with a prospective client in a way where we can sell. I know like what the one thing that really resonated with me when we invited you to speak was something you said about the conversation with a prospective client. And you had said that when we um, tend to get insecure right when it's time to ask for money or something like that, um, we tend to abandon the client just when they need them the most. When you said that to me, it just went poof because the I've been coaching for 20 years, yet I've always struggled with the sales process. Uh -huh. And the reason I struggled with the sales process is because I couldn't get past this inner conflict that kept saying, I stand for being in integrity with people and standing for their agenda. So how can I put a technique into place in my enrollment process that manipulates them and supports my agenda? And what you said really shifted that for me. So I just want to lead you with that because that's the compelling question that I was so excited that really, you know, paved the way for going, I am going to be here all four sessions, listening to every single word and soaking up as much as I can. Sure. That's, that is a high bar and I will endeavor to meet it. So let's start with, uh, I'll talk a bit and then you can sort of steer us wherever it feel, you know, feels good. Um, but the experience you just described, well, actually, could I just say a show of hands, anyone else that can relate to that, where it's like, oh, I love this thing I do called coaching, and I really don't like so much this thing that is attached to it, bolted on the side called sales or creating clients. Is there any? Okay, great. Thank you for those that raised your hands. And um, let's hear from Mel. What is your experience of sales? Like I saw you didn't put your hand up. So tell me how, it, how you experienced that. I'm actually an internal coach. I um, coach financial advisors and their team, and I come from a cool. financial advisor background. Um, so I came here to learn more about what it could be like to transition into my own business and open coaching up to more professions. Got it. Cool. Um, so, yeah, thank you. So it sounds like for you, there's not so much of a sales process because you're kind of, the, the clients are brought to you. Um, well, there's no money exchange because I'm a salaried coach with the right. firm. Um, there's a recruiting process that I go through because I want to bring in my own clients, but I think you also come to me um, from the firm. Great. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing that. So the place most of us, or at least my experience, most coaches come to this is sort of like, like I described, there's this amazing career I have called coaching. It's like the best thing in the world. I love doing it. It's so great. 
once we have an agreement in place, once money is out of the way. That part beforehand kind of sucks. I don't really love it. It feels kind of awkward. And the, the place that we tend to get stuck is often some flavor of, okay, people have fear about hiring me as a coach. And now I want to honor what's showing up for them. And at the same time, I know that if they work with me, something magic will happen, but then they're kind of like a no, not now. And so how do I possibly square that circle? And there's a couple of solutions that I see um, kind of get created in the industry at large. So one of those solutions is outsource that. So you hire someone to make you a funnel system, or you hire one of these people that keep adding me on LinkedIn that are like, I help clients get six figure, actually six figures is no longer on Vogue. Seven figures is the new number. I help clients get seven figure leads effortlessly without blah, 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 blah. Um, so there's kind of this approach like outsource that. So I don't have to do that work and I can just get the leads and then I can get sooner to the work that I love of coaching. Um, the other one is to simply kind of avoid it altogether. So this isn't to say this is why you found yourself what you're doing, Mel, but there's like by going in house or something like that, we kind of get to not have to so much go through that sales process. We don't have to meet people. We don't have to be in a conversation. We don't have to support them to overcome the objections that they've got, the fears about money or whatever. And what happens with both of these solutions, while they're totally fine, there's a aspect of working with a client that gets stepped over. And both of those are kind of like an approach that I, I want to be clear, there's nothing wrong about those approaches, but underlying them often is like a way of avoiding having to be with that thing that's kind of edgy for us. And when we avoid being with something, we also avoid the breakthrough that might be available if we were to really be with that thing. Can I just get some nodding heads or something to indicate you guys are, okay, people understand they're with me. Okay, great. Gregory, is this like you're nodding your head sort of forward and back for me? Okay, bit, bit, bit of both. Okay, cool. Um, and so let me just find my words here and have a sip of coffee. The, the other place that um, people come to from this, so there's one which is to avoid the thing. The other is to sort of adopt this attitude like, hey, I, I know that if the client gets into work with me, I know that if I get them into a paid coaching agreement with me, their life will shift. There is benefit on the other side of this fence. So I'll, I'll learn the sales techniques, I'll do whatever I need to do to get them over their fear, and then we can get to the thing that's gonna help them out that's gonna really make a difference in their lives. So it's kind of like, how do I get really good at selling someone? How do I get really good at convincing people beyond their objections? So the first approach is a little bit like, just avoid those objections altogether. The second approach is kind of like bulldoze them, convince them, move them past it, do whatever the high pressure sales technique is. And in both of those, we're kind of stepping over the client. One, by avoiding the client altogether, and two, by like, I understand you're scared, but I just need to get you into this thing without us spending too much time here because once you're in the thing, then you'll be happy. Is this making sense? Karen, I can't tell if you're confused or if you're following me, so I'm gonna check in with you. Yeah, um, <laughs> good idea. I'm, I'm not confused. What I'm thinking about is, I mean, I hear what you're saying. You can outsource. I get a lot of those emails, all that good stuff. Yeah. I do coaching in large corporations. So I need to interact with the key decision maker and it's usually the HR person. And I'm not afraid to have that conversation. What I'm noticing, especially since COVID, because these are HR people, their heads are spinning on their necks. They're trying to figure out how to safely bring people back to work, not bring, bring people back to work. I mean, just there's so many issues. I'm having trouble even getting them to connect with me. Got it. So, Great. I, so I hear all the things you're saying, and I have been in the past very 
afraid. And I think I've really been pushing through that. Nice. And I'm at a place where it's like, yeah, let's, let's talk about it. I, I don't need to sell you on this. Let's just, let's talk about it. Let's talk about what it is and, you know, how it works and get them curious and get them engaged. So I'm tracking with you and I'm kind of on my own little page. Yeah. Yeah, you're a little bit further along than the, the, the initial foundation I'm setting. So that's great. Thanks for sharing that. And yeah. I think we'll, in future conversations, come around to that. Mm -hmm. And I also realized that there's two Karens on this call. So thank you, Karen Holmes. Karen Gifford, I also wanted to hear from you and just see what's there for you as I speak about this. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, I've been impressed by the ICF Orange County chapter and joined because of the great programming that they have. And you're certainly at the top of that list today. So thanks. Thank you. And thanks, Nahid and Nanor, for, for all that you do to make this stuff happen. Um, and everybody else on the board, too. Greta, I mean, there's so many people that I, I could be grateful to. So um, I, I, my uh, own observation around the selling process is that sometimes we as coaches this is more of a check-in, that sometimes we as coaches don't really think about our own sales processes. In other words, what do we need to be sure we've got a, a client that we want to serve, that we are, we have a, a process that we say, yes, I want a client who one wants to be coached, who has the time to coach, who has, you know, what is our checklist that we need to take them through to be sure that they're a fit for us. And I see sometimes that um, even with internal coaches that I've had a chance to, or internal coaches and internal HR people, when I get a chance to work with them, I find that they haven't thought about that. And so it's, it's one of those things that as I'm listening to this, I'm wondering if other people have a, have a process around that themselves. So it's more of me like, okay, well, I'm the only one who's been doing this or do other people have it? And two, what's been your experience in that? And has it served you or, or not? Or have you not even thought about it? Great question. So I'm going to, and, and thanks for speaking. It was, it was surprising because at first I called on you and then I heard you speaking, but your lips weren't moving. And then I realized there was a second Karen. So I'm glad that we've resolved that. Um, I will speak briefly to that and then bring us back. So like, it sounds like what you're describing is before I even get to the point where it's like, does this person want to work with me and how do I support them to work with me? If so, there's kind of this other conversation like, well, do I want to work with them? Is this my kind of person? So absolutely, there's like a conversation around that and where I'm kind of um, starting the conversation off based on what Nahid has mentioned is really that point where we've realized, okay, I want to work with this person. I'm a yes to them. And I think they're a yes to me. And then what happens is their objections show up. We all have objections like, ah, you know, I really want to do this. It's just a bit too expensive or, hey, COVID struck and now it's just not the time or, hey, I just don't have time right now. My life's a bit of a mess or my husband doesn't want me to do this or my wife doesn't want me to do this or I've got to, you know, whatever. But there's some kind of objection that shows up. And so really just to finish setting this context for kind of like the conversations going forward, what I notice tends to happen is one of those two things as a default, broad generalizations, but we tend to either collapse into the client's objection, which would be sort of like, oh, I totally get it, no worries, I understand, not now, next month, whatever it happens to be, or we try to bulldoze them, which is okay, yeah, I got that, but let me try to convince you why this is worth the money, or hey, let's look at your calendar and figure this out. So there's, there's that paving over them to get them into the coaching, and then we can empower that because we're like, well, at least I know if they get into the coaching, then things will get good. Even if this part right here feels kind of crappy, later on, it'll be good and they'll thank me for it. Or we collapse into it. We avoid going into the heart of the matter with the client. So just as like a, a broad general distinction of the kind of two places we can show up when our clients have objections, does this make sense to everyone? Okay, great. Is there anyone totally lost at this point? Yes, Karen. I'm not, I'm not lost. I'm just okay. noticing that in coaching, I think the person has to have a desire to be there. Yes, absolutely. And 
it's really not enjoyable or fruitful in my experience to try to coach people that are not open to it. I mean, personally, I don't want to do it because that, that's like a fixture upper, you know? Can I, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So how does that relate to what I've just pointed to? Well, you were saying if you can just get them into the coaching agreement, then everything will be great. Right. And my experience has been that that is a, a bit of a fantasy, <laughs> yeah. right? You get them in, everything's going to be great. And, you know, I've had them in and I thought, oh, this is really terrible. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so I guess you, just. Um, you're a hundred percent right. What you're pointing to. And so. Oh, and somebody just said in the chat, non-coachable people is not the issue. Yeah. yeah so. Oh, maybe so I'm, gonna, I'm off point. No, you're, well, you're doing fine, Karen. You're doing great. It's, it's more that where we're looking just as a starting point is the sales process itself. And what you're speaking to is really one of the objections coaches often have like, well, if the person's a no, I don't want to travel this path. I'm not going to go down that path. And what tends to happen as coaches is as soon as we hear an objection, as soon as we hear, I'd love to do this. I just don't have time. That becomes a concrete, no end of the story. And then we're like, I don't want to coach them because they're going to be uncoachable, blah, 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 blah. So all no, I'm doing I would is say, I would say what else is getting in the way? And I would just take all of their objections. <laughs> I, I got it. I totally got it. Yeah. I, I just want to be clear. Like my intention here is to set a really broad break, a base and offer two places. People tend to go in the face of a client's objection. Okay. And, and show that there's, they're both ways of avoiding being with the client. So to bring this into a different perspective, a different frame. First of all, can I, I got, Karen, that's not maybe super clear for you, but has everyone else got kind of like, okay, I can kind of see in the general sense, there's kind of these one of two places we can go. We can kind of collapse into the client's objections or we can kind of bulldoze them or convince them or move them through it. I get that there's always going to be nuances, but can everyone else kind of get a rough sense of what I'm pointing to? Yeah, I mean, I'll jump in and just say, Please. it's funny, I would, I would, as I reflect on my experience in the whole enrollment process, I have been plagued by feeling like I err on one end or the other. So yeah. when I do what I think I'm supposed to do, I become somewhat like your bulldozer because I have thought that I was being courageous and in being courageous, I've been implementing some strategy that I was taught that I should be doing. And it becomes incredibly awkward and usually I scare people away when that happens. Yes. But then to not go there because that's so embarrassing and humiliating and awkward. Um, typically what I'll do is I'll err on what you call the imploding part. So the objections start coming up and I do exactly what you said. I said, oh, well, you know, I want to honor them. I certainly don't want to, um, you know, push any harder. And I've had some great conversations where I've probably done it perfectly, but it, but over time, when I'm insecure at all, I'll err on the imploding side. So I don't know. I'm like, there's a part of me that's, that's very curious as to how many people on here do it one way and the other, but I don't want to distract from what you're saying. And we also have someone who's been asking in the chat to hear kind of your journey coming into it. And I think we can definitely pull that in to this as well. Yeah. So I'm going to wind this up. Really, my intention is to set a bit of the foundation for where we go going forward. So that tends to be where we get stuck as coaches. And the opportunity is to start to relate to your client's objection as it shows up in terms of working with you is the same objection that's going to get in the way of any project they take on in their life. If your client comes to you and is like, look, I'd really love to work with you, Michael, but I just don't have the time. Things are crazy. My kids, Trump, Hillary, whatever. I just don't have time. So maybe in a year's time, what we tend to do in that conversation, imagine you were working with your client on a project that they had enrolled you in and told you, look, this is the project for me, Greta, this is going to be amazing. I'm going to be a rock star. Everything's going to be different. I can see everything that's going to be possible. My ecosystem will shift all of that. And then you started to support them and they said, oh, last week, yes, I was really pumped and I'm still pumped. 
it's just going to have to wait for a year because I just don't have the time right now and things are crazy and yada, yada, yada. It would be weird as coach to be like, okay, well, maybe we'll talk about this project in a year's time. Instead, we would start to relate to this like, okay, well, tell me about that. Let's look at what's showing up. And so what I'm intending to draw here is that there's a distinction in the way we be with our clients when working with us is on the table. And the opportunity is to bring those two together so that who we get to be for and with our clients, whether it's in a sales conversation or creating a client or supporting them to create their projects can be the exact same way. And when we start to merge these two together, when we become integrated in how we be and support our clients, that's where real prosperity comes into being. We don't have to run sales tricks or fool them. We just get to be with them however they're showing up. So I want to start to move on. We'll talk more about this in the coming conversations. But is this kind of making sense to people? Just that idea that there could be that merger where we get to show up the same way regardless. Okay, great. I see some nodding heads. Excellent. Um, Nahi, do you want to take the question and I'll speak to it? Yeah, I would say that the, the general the general gist of the question is, how did you develop your sales process? Hmm. And I, I guess I should I guess I should just check with Jackie to make sure I, I got that. And Jackie, if you want, you can just unmute yourself and ask and and ask that question. Uh, yes. Yeah. Exactly. I was um, would love to hear a little process because you know, like most of us, he changed careers. You know, he went from software we've done as well, not in that particular industries, but yeah, like how did he go from you know attorney to executive coach as in a private practice? I assume. Thank you. Got it. Um. So let's see. The, I mean, the timeline was basically there was a year where I'd um, finished my training and I was working as a lawyer and I knew that I didn't want to continue practicing law. And so I was basically hustling. I was doing the blue collar work of coaching is what a brilliant coach named Steve Chandler describes. He says, he calls it that way because he says, you know, a lot of people when they want to be coach, they kind of get up and they're like, I don't feel like doing this today. And they don't do it. And he invites us to relate to this work as the same way a truck driver would relate to their work. When a truck driver gets up, he doesn't get to say, I don't feel like driving truck today. He gets in his truck and he drives because he's committed to something and because that's what the job calls for. And so in the early days, um, and this is not necessarily, this is more of the doing I'm going to be describing as opposed to the way of being underneath, which is what I think is really transformative. But the doing for me in the early days, that first year was really, um, I would get up at probably, I think six o'clock. I would go into the law firm I was working at and work for eight hours. And then I would come home, I would eat a quick dinner and then I would, I would reach out to people. I would get into conversation with people to start to create relationships and to invite them into coaching conversations. And so there's a lot of hustle in those early days. And um, that's not to suggest that has to be the way it looks. That's simply the way it looked for me. And the reason it looked that way for me is because that's what was my default. The, what I mean by that is when I finally reached the point where I was ready to take the terrifying step of saying goodbye to law and going full, co full time into coaching, I had this fantasy in my mind, which was, oh, baby. I'm not going to be working law anymore. I'm going to have all the time in the world. I'm going to play that video game that everyone's been talking about. I'm going to go for long walks. I'm going to watch the sunrise and the sunset. And then what I immediately did was create the same circumstances that existed in my law practice. I found myself working nine to 10 hours a day, every day, trying to create clients and drum up business. And so what they're really part of the work that was there for me was like, what about shifting my relationship to time? What about shifting my relationship to abundance so I could have a different way of showing up in my life, regardless of the circumstances that were going on? And that's a bit of a vague answer. So if there's some more specific answer, I'm happy to provide it. Oh, you're, you're muted, Naid. Maybe intentionally. <laughs> so did you really have to learn the sales enrollment process? Were you doing it differently then than you're doing it now? Like 
was there like an internal shift that made your sales conversation or your enrollment conversation much more powerful or different? Yes, absolutely. So in the early days, my sales process looked kind of like throwing spaghetti at a wall. And um, it's a bit of a crass metaphor, but it'd be like I'd go out on a date with someone and then immediately be like, so do you want to have sex? That was how I was being about coaching. So I'd meet someone, we'd talk for 10 minutes, and I'd be like, so how about coaching? And if you do that enough, and you're willing to be with the impact of that, then some people will say yes. So it's not that that never worked. It's just not a very sophisticated or even a particularly fruitful approach. And so it took time for me to move beyond that. That's what I started doing. And then I would often bring a frustration to my coach, like, ah, I'm in all these conversations and they're going nowhere. And stupid people aren't saying yes to this amazing offer I'm putting in front of them. And so at that point in my, in my growth, I really had to learn first how to just connect with a human being because I wasn't doing that at all. I was talking to someone as a means to an end and the end was to get them into a coaching conversation, which feels crappy for both people. And so first I just had to learn, how do I just be in a conversation with someone where we're connecting? And then the next, this kind of gets into the, the, the six steps required to create a client. You know, once I was connecting with people, I had to learn how do I actually create possibility with people as opposed to just connecting? What a lot of us do initially is we'll meet someone at a networking event and we'll talk about the wallpaper or the weather or politics or whatever is like the easy default conversation that the whole world is having because it's not edgy and it's comfortable and people will meet you there because that's where we meet everyone. But that's kind of been like the way I would be showing up was kind of if you and I talked and complained about something for a half hour. And then I said, thanks for complaining about stuff for a half hour. Want to have a coaching conversation? So even though we're now connecting a little bit, there's no reason for someone to say yes to a coaching conversation. So next I had to learn how to actually get curious about the possibility that might be available in this person's life outside of what they're already reliable for. There is a path that people are on that includes some stuff they have not yet created, but they're already reliable to do. What I mean by that is when I was practicing software, I was completely reliable to get into law school, to succeed at it and to become an attorney. I didn't need outside support. There was no breakthrough required for me to make that happen in my life. But to have an experience of an open heart and be connected with God and spirit and to really love people beyond them being useful to me, that was totally unpredictable for me. And as we start to develop and I had to learn to develop the ability to get curious about and ask people about and develop their possibility in a conversation. Now they have a reason to say yes to a coaching conversation. Now they're like, holy cow, I've never actually thought of that in my life, but that sounds amazing. And now we can start to be in a conversation with them like, look, that's what I do with people. Do you want to have a conversation about that? I think it'd be fun for me and I'd love to support you in that. My gift to you. So these are just the first three steps. I had to... <laughs> I didn't have to, but I bungled my way through these very effectively. And um, I'm, I'm conscious of time. I can share more about it if, if that's where we feel called to go, but uh, happy to share more. But that's kind of the initial set of stumbling around that I had to do. Love it. Love it. Um, Adam, do, as we are getting close to um, our time here, would you be willing to kind of give us an overview of what to expect in the next three classes? And then if we have time, um, we'll get a few gems from the room. And for those of you who don't have the time, you might want to just like type in the chat box what you're taking away because we really want Adam to hear your gems. Jackie AQ is me, Adam Quiney. Um, so we're uh, kind of main things and, and this is a little bit flexible, you know, depending on where the group is and what is called for, we can adapt all of this, but the next time we'll lay out the six steps of creating a client. These aren't like rigid things you have to do. This isn't a funnel system. This is basically a process of deepening intimacy with our client. And what I notice happens for most coaches is we get fixated on proposing to them or getting them to say yes to a coaching conversation. And what that has us do is totally lose sight of everything that has to come before that. Sort of like if you were a baby and you wanted to learn how to run, the first thing you have to do is learn how to crawl. 
but it's like we're all babies and we're fixated on getting that gold medal and it gets us all tripped up and we can't seem to just learn the steps naturally. So we'll go through the six steps. Those are connection, possibility, invitation, coaching, proposing, and supporting the yes, getting the client to the yes. Um, the, that'll be the next conversation. The conversation after that will spend mostly on working through objections. And that might be where um, we also have some time to talk about what Karen Holmes brought forward, which is more of a corporate HR kind of context. But either way, really that conversation where the client's got something in the way and rather than bulldozing them or just collapsing into it, we be with them in that and, so, and give them that first really powerful experience of coaching before they've even hired us which I think is magic and miraculous. And then the third conversation will probably be more, this one is a little more flexible and fluid, but one of the places I think might be really cool to look is at a niche that really sets your client's heart on fire. Because often what we do is we look at a niche based on someone's identity, sort of like gender, color of their the race, et cetera, et cetera, or based on what they're doing which is totally fine, but there's a much deeper level at which we can connect to the heart of our clients and really speak to them in such a way that they're like, holy cow, there's no one else in the world but you for me. Can we talk? So those will be roughly the three conversations and it's all open to, um, to fixing or to changing. Excellent. Adam, really quick, if you can repeat the six steps. Yes. I want to share a takeaway. Great. And I will also say I've got a um, handout, an infographic that has all these six steps um, laid out that I will give to you, Nahid, and then you can share it with everyone. So that'll, that helps too. The six steps are connection, uh, possibility, invitation, coach, propose, and then support the yes. And that Excellent. handout will make them all a little more clear, as will our conversations. Excellent. Well, I am so looking forward to all of our sessions in November. And I'll just say, you know, one of my big takeaways, and this is something that I've always believed, so I guess I would say it's a validation, but I absolutely passionately believe that coaching is a unique profession. And in order to be really successful at it, you really have to be committed to transforming yourself. And the encouragement that I got today is some of the work that I'm doing right now to transform myself, I can already see that it's supporting my ability to sell more effectively. Does anyone else have a quick gem that I'd like to share with Adam, a great takeaway? Um, a takeaway to create abundance from Greta, thank you. Anyone else before we wrap up? I would just say thank you, Adam, um, for uh, just the authenticity and the openness that you come to it with and not making it salesy or anything like that, right? Because that's our thing that blocks us. <laughs> but, but what it really reminded me of is, um, and I thank you for this, is to stay committed to um, the intention to relate to the person sitting across and remain in that relatedness, mm. the human to human conversation, you know? And so, you know, thanks for that re reminder. I appreciate that. Beautiful. Thank you. I got something just from you sharing that. Love that. And um, as you may see, Adam, the, the chat's lighting up. I know we're, we're a little bit past our time, so I think a couple people have to get off. But if you'd like to stay for just a couple minutes and, and share your takeaway in person with Adam, please do. And um, anyone else, but for the rest of you, thank you so much and look forward to seeing you at the next one. And we will follow up with that handout. Yes. Yeah, go ahead and unmute yourself. Anybody would like to share any goodbye or thank you for my, my I said Mike limit, Adam. <laughs> Karen, I can, oh, I was gonna say I can see she wants to say something, but okay. All right. Well, I think thank we're you, done. Adam. That was awesome. Thanks, awesome. everyone. Okay, so thank you everyone. And um, well, we'll be talking back and forth with you, Adam. Yes. Uh, we can move forward and plan the next ones in November. Um, I love that. And um, we'll debrief later. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Nahid.